Thank you, Suzanne. Kind introduction. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's uh, really a great pleasure to have all of you here early Monday morning. Uh, but we have assembled a diverse audience here. We have people who are here from the nonprofit community, from technology, academics, U.S. government, bringing everyone together to address this issue. I want to especially thank our panelists um, who will really enhance the work that we're doing here today. Many of them have come from thousands of miles away, even including Afghanistan. So uh, I really want to express appreciation for that, uh, for that effort. And I want to also issue a special welcome um, and uh, recognition for all the U.S. embassies around the world, which are viewing this via live stream. They're in Uruguay, in uh, Guatemala, Colombia, China, India, Estonia, Kenya, and I think some other places where they've uh, also linked up. Now today, as uh, Suzanne mentioned, this is the second iteration of the Tech at State series. The first one was launched after the devastating earthquake in Haiti. Tech at State was born out of a desire of this administration to harness all of the tools at our disposal in the pursuit of U.S. foreign policy agenda. I see this conference as an example of the new direction that Secretary Clinton has set for our foreign policy. It is one of innovative thinking, of an expansive worldview, and of an understanding that our goals will only be achieved when the least among us are given an opportunity like all the rest. It is a path of foreign policy in which the pillars of security and stability are complemented and reinforced by concepts like inclusion and responsibility. In particular, Secretary Clinton has elevated two priorities at the State Department that bring us here today. The first is what we call 21st century statecraft the use of technology and innovative tools for the empowerment of people and for building or stabilizing nations. This is a powerful concept. And when you consider the potential that technology has to change our world, it becomes even more powerful. The second concept is one that is close to my heart. And it's the concept of financial inclusion. The idea that the banking systems of the world should be comprised by a wide array of providers that are able to serve all segments of the population. And that financial opportunity shouldn't be limited to those with traditional assets or credit stories that a bank can respect. And at the nexus of these two concepts lies mobile money, mobile payments, mobile banking, mobile financial services. We recognize the distinction among these terms, but we also understand that the underlying premise is the same, and as I said, it is powerful. Using the mobile phone, often already in the hands of the poor and the unbanked, as a conduit for economic decisions, transactions, and opportunity. This is why we're here today. By 2012, 1.7 billion low-income people around the world will have a mobile phone. This trend alone has changed the course of human development. And demographic trends, such as the growing number of youth who adopt technology faster, a lot faster, and the movement, the growing movement into the cities, these two things where, and in the cities where the networks are cheaper and faster, this is what will bolster the mobile usage more and more. We are also here today because billions of people remain outside of the realm of economic opportunity that is represented by financial access. We understand the significance of moving more and more people into the global and formal financial markets and expanding the, the concept of financial inclusion, opening opportunity at the bottom of the pyramid creating better banking systems. The advances of the microfinance industry from its pioneering works in the early 1970s, which fortunately or unfortunately I remember and participated in, demonstrate to us that this is not only possible, but it's also sustainable 
and it's profitable. Microfinance has taught us several things about business at the bottom of the pyramid. First, it shifted the long-held notion about banking and the poor. Put simply, we now know that the poor are credit worthy, that they pay back their loans. The fact that they lack assets or working capital doesn't mean that they lack entrepreneurship or that they, like, that they lack drive. On the contrary, microfinance has demonstrated how low income men and women are dignified by the opportunity to manage their business, build their business, and make better economic decisions for their families. Second, microfinance has highlighted the need to revise business models as we better understand the needs and habits of the poor. At Acción International, where I served for 10 years as CEO prior to joining the State Department, we were always in the habit of reinventing ourselves and reinventing our business model. Not once, not twice, but repeatedly. Such reinvention was the source of our innovation and our success. In the 1970s, Axiom pioneered group lending, solidarity groups, we called them. In the 1980s, we focused on individual lending as an alternative to group lending. In the 1990s, we launched the first commercial bank for microfinance, Banco Sol, in Bolivia. And in the last decade, Acción helped crack the capital markets for investment in microfinance to enable it to grow to scale. More recently, Acción is recasting its business model again to better incorporate the role of technology, like mobile phones, to bring microfinance to scale. Now, of course, Acción is not the only organization to employ this innovation. Many are doing it, but of course it's the one that I happen to know best. There are many and we find them everywhere from Malawi to the Philippines to India. They are surging forward incorporating microfinance with technology. Everyone in this room and viewing in the internet understands the significance of the potential of innovation at the bottom of the pyramid. So that's why we are all here today, to discuss and explore how one of the century's most promising innovations, mobile money, can help achieve important shared objectives. Mobile money represents a next step in the evolution of the microfinance industry. But it also extends beyond that realm, with promising implications for food security, for global health, for legal identity, for governance, for accountability. Of course, our greatest immediate challenge will be how to address all of these issues in the space of the four hours that we have today. But I'm sure you will do a great job. Before, before I close, so you can get going, and I introduce the next speakers, there's a couple of words that I want to say about how the State Department fits into this space. Surely you're all wondering, or some of you are wondering, why we diplomats are hosting this event about which we really have very little technical expertise. We have some, but very little. But I think and I hope that the State Department and the U.S. government can contribute to this industry. And I hope we can do it in three principal ways. First, the thousands of U.S. diplomats around the world, we are well placed to help generate and improve the political will that is needed to create enabling environments for innovations like mobile banking. Take, for instance, our friends in Guatemala. I believe that we have senior officials of the central bank that are with us today, uh, obviously by connection. And they have been working with the Treasury Department uh, to pass landmark legislation in that country for microfinance. I want personally to thank them for their vision and I want to hear more about their progress, also to see how we can use that experience in other countries. We know that from Guatemala to Kenya, from Pakistan to the Philippines, governments are proactively addressing the policies and regulations necessary for mobile banking to be able to work in their own countries. The United States is committed to supporting their work and helping to share their respective lessons with other nations. 
Together, Treasury, USAID, and others are advancing important work in this area. And the State Department is highlighting the potential of financial inclusion and mobile innovation in our policy conversations with governments around the world. Second, as today indicates, the State Department can be a convener of important stakeholders. It can play the role of bringing people together and stimulate the conversation and the collaboration that is going to be very important as we move this industry forward. I hope that the discussions that take place today are really only the beginning of what we hope will be an ongoing opportunity to discuss and advance our work in this area. And third, through these meetings, we're able to facilitate and to create exciting pilot projects, such as the High Five Innovation, Innovation Fund in Haiti that was announced by AID and the Gates Foundation last month from where Priya just came back from viewing that, uh, that effort. We are working on moving, on improving mobile usage in countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo. We hope to connect leading mobile remittances companies, uh, such as Envia, which is here today, with leading microfinance providers in the developing world. And I know that Ambassador Milan Vivier, who many of you know, who heads up the global women's issues at the State Department, is working very hard on this. She's got an initiative with uh, GSMA and with Sherry Blair Foundation on the M Women Initiative, which aims to close the gender gap in mobile usage around the developing world. In my own career, I have seen the power of fresh thinking in business. I've seen the power of innovation at the bottom of the pyramid. I have seen the power of believing in the ingenuity of the poor and of investing in risky ventures. The lessons I learned in the markets in Lima, in Accra, in Mumbai have guided my conversations on Wall Street. And they have guided my discussions with senior officials from Pakistan to Indonesia to Brazil. And I look forward to learning more from all of you. Together, I am confident that we will be able to make enormous stride in advancing the financial inclusion and the social goal throughout the world. And I want to thank you for everything that you are doing. And now let me take a minute and introduce our distinguished next speakers. Carol Rialini Rian, Rian, and Young Chip Chase. Carol is a lifelong entrepreneur and the CEO of Obupay, a pioneer in bridging mobile phone usage with financial inclusion. Carol has led the IPOs and acquisition of many companies, as well as overseeing major partnerships in the area of inclusive and innovative banking. Thank you, Carol, for being here. And this is just really uh, wonderful to be able to have all your expertise. Jan is the Executive Creative Director of Global Insights for Frog Design, a global innovation firm. Jan joined Frog from Nokia and is an expert in applying human-centered insights to the design of new tools for development. Jan joins us from Shanghai, so that's a very long way to come to be able to be here. I want to thank him for doing that. And now, with nothing more from me, let the conversation begin. Thank you. Thank you.